was asked to give this talk on this subject, and it was really interesting for me to put it together. Um, Dr. Brown and I are actually the same age, but I was a school teacher before I was a veterinarian, so I got a later start in veterinary medicine. Um, so I'm going to take you back 35 years instead of 40 years. And it was interesting for me to go back and think about what we knew about rabbit surgery 35 years ago and what, where we are now. Um, this is Joey Truffles. Dr. Uh, Knowles no, knows Joey quite well. I don't know if he's ever met him or seen a picture of him, but his owner would call uh, Dr. Knowles all the time and complain about the, whatever she found in the critical care or whatever. But um, I first got to know Joey when he was a year old, and his owner lives on Lake Tahoe in Nevada, and every two to, or six to eight weeks I would fly there to um, work on his teeth. And he lived to be 10, he passed away two years ago, uh, but without the advances that we've made in those 35 years, I'm sure he never would have made it that far. So what, what did we have 35 years ago? When I went to vet school, very little was taught about rabbit medicine and surgery. We had one elective course, so not everyone had to take it. And rabbits were a very small part of it because it was all exotics, from snakes to um, birds and everything. Uh, not many veterinary schools had the ability to treat rabbits because uh, none of the staff doctors were comfortable treating them. What I remember is all, pa all rabbits get pasteurella, and if you have a rabbit tree, coccidiosis is a big problem, and the only surgical disease I ever knew about was hairballs. <laughs> Our main resource was Harkness and Wagner, Biology and Medicine of Rabbits and Rodents, and, and it's a good book, and they just came out a few years ago with a more recent edition. I can't remember if it's the fifth or sixth, but it's geared towards laboratory animal rather than um, pet animals. Still not every vet school includes rabbit medicine and surgery in the curriculum, but a lot more do, and a lot more have clinical programs in exotic animals that include rabbits, and a lot more teach rabbit medicine. So that means a lot more veterinarians are knowledgeable, there are a lot more resources at conferences and so forth for veterinarians to learn about rabbit medicine and surgery. One of the main resources is Quisenberry and Carpenter's book, uh, originally Quisenberry and Hillier, or Hillier and Quisenberry, and it's affectionately known as the pink book because the first version was pink. Um, now it's kind of a dark pink, but I think they maintained the pink because it got known as, everyone just calls it the pink book. And this book was geared more towards medicine and surgery and pet rabbits and rodents and ferrets. So going back to some of the, um, I'm, I'm going to do sort of a comparison of my memory of 35 years ago. Um, blood work uh, is an important part of evaluating not only the problem the animal is presenting for, but we want to see if there are other issues that need to be dealt with. Um, for example, if a rabbit has a broken leg, I don't think I'll get to it, but at the end of this talk, I have a story about a rabbit with a broken leg. We took chest x-rays, and he had mineralized aorta, mineralized heart valves. He had stones in the bladder. So these are things that we want to know about before we go into surgery. And the first line is um, blood work. Well, why didn't we do it? Well, the veins are small. Um, back then, most laboratories that we sent blood work to didn't do exotic animals, didn't do blood work on rabbits. And part of the reason was they needed a large quantity of blood. So if we have a small patient and we can't take five cc's of blood, when you go to the doctor, you see how many tubes of blood they fill out. It's amazing. And I go, like, we get this much. How can we do all these tests with this much blood? And you need 10 vacutainers full. Um, so, and we've now got normal reference ranges established, um, but again, sometimes clients would decline these tests due to cost, and I still hear that today, and that's where you guys can make a difference. Um, and think about your own medical care, and blood work is a vital part of that. 
So there are a number of places that we can get blood in rabbits. This is a lateral saphenous vein. You can see it here. Here's a, a thumb, and there's a tiny needle going to get a blood sample. And um, so we're a lot more proficient at getting blood from small animals now. It's interesting where I work currently, the technicians have a uh, philosophy that doctors cannot draw blood, like they're incompetent in drawing blood. And I see them struggling with, you know, a puppy or a kitten or whatever, trying to get blood. And I go, oh, you want me to do it? Oh, no, no, that's OK. Um, Sal's going to come over and try. You know, I ha I've done animals that weigh less than 30 grams. and. <laughs> But they, they just have this mindset that doctors shouldn't be drawing blood. Um, also, the, just the, the anatomy with the ear, and certainly when I was in school, we were taught about drawing blood from the ear. Um, but they didn't tell me that the big one down in the middle is actually an artery and not a vein. And the veins are on the edge of the ear. Um, and you can get blood from an artery, that's not a problem. In fact, it works better because it's got pressure and it shoots it out. Um, but there's also the potential for sloughing. And I recently was doing a rabbit at LSU. They flew me out there to do some surgery on this rabbit. And then I think a month later I went back because it had both ears abscessed and the jaw abscessed. So I did the ears the first time and the jaw the second time. And it, I came back and its ear was like this. And they go, oh yeah, that's because we had it on fluids. OK. So they just kind of expected the ear to slough. I don't expect that. Um, so now we have more experience with phlebotomy, both veterinarians and technicians getting sm small samples from small patients. Um, nearly all commercial laboratories that I know run rabbit blood and have reference ranges, so that's a, a nice change. Um, we still have to negotiate the cost, and I was talking to one of the vendors and, uh, earlier, and um, th I made the comment that um, one of one time someone asked me what was the worst part about being a veterinarian, and I said money. And, you know, it still is today because not only do I think I'm underpaid, but everything we do we have to negotiate with the owner because you don't have insurance. Now, who among you would go to the doctor and the doctor says we need to do um, blood work, a urinalysis, a CAT scan of your head, and then we'll schedule surgery and you go, you know, I don't want the CAT scan on my head because it's too expensive. Um, but in veterinary medicine, we have to do that all the time. So um, preoperative blood work is vital to establishing the patient's status before surgery and to look for other conditions it might have that might affect the outcome. Other tests, imaging has certainly come a long way. Um, Back then, we didn't do a lot of radiographs. It was difficult to restrain them in proper position. I have to say, still today, uh, I get a lot of radiographs sent to me that are very badly positioned, um, even in my own hospital sometimes. Uh, with rabbits, we have the risk of injuring them. And um, also, then, if, if you sedate them, there is an additional cost and an additional risk if you have to sedate an animal just to take radiographs. It can, they can be difficult to interpret. So if you don't know what the normal radiographic anatomy is, you don't know if that's normal or not normal, and I will show you some examples of that as we go along. Again, we have the cost issue, and you know, I teach young people now, and when I tell them that when I went to vet school, um, ultrasound didn't exist, they don't believe me. <laughs> I, I was watching the news this morning and they had a thing about um, Fleming who discovered penicillin. I guess it, it was some anniversary of him discovering penicillin. And I was surprised that it was only 50 some years ago that he discovered penicillin. Well, I remember before Betro. <laughs> So rabbits have a smaller or a less dense skeleton than other animals. Above is a cat and below is a, a rabbit. And you can see that the rabbit skeleton isn't as dense as the cat skeleton, so they're more prone to spinal fractures, which is what that 
arrow is pointing to. This is a radiograph of a skull, and when I say it can be difficult to interpret things, you can see like if you were trying to figure out what was wrong in this picture, you'd have a hard time. Um, one of those things that I told you, uh, it probably doesn't show up so well here, um, that I didn't know was abnormal was that rabbit skull bone has sort of a foamy appearance to it, and I thought that meant it was infected the first time I saw it, but it doesn't. So now we have great technologies. Most veterinary practices have digital radiology now. Not all, but it's coming more and more common. Um, those images can be manipulated. The, the density, the whiteness and darkness can be changed. You can magnify, and so it really has changed radiology a lot. CT scans are helpful primarily for bone lesions, so if you're looking for a brain tumor, it's not the best thing to use. An MRI is more helpful for soft tissue lesions like a brain tumor. Where I like CT and rabbits are for um, the below or the middle ear, which is a bony shell, and for jaw abscesses to evaluate them. Ultrasound is also very versatile and used a lot. Um, it did actually come out shortly after I finished my training in surgery, so in the late 80s it became more common to see it in, in practice. But it has its limitations. It can't go through bone and it's reflected back by air. So if there's a lot of air in the stomach or the intestine or certainly in the chest with the lungs full of air, it can limit what they can image. And I say they because I don't know how to drive one. I have to get someone else to do it. Um, so, so this is a, a radiograph of a rabbit's head. And I'll point out that um, most of these images you'll see that my rabbits are intubated. And when later on there are some that aren't, that was because they were in the 80s. Um, and so the, you get this kind of image and you can digitally magnify it so then you can now look at the fine detail of the bone where we couldn't do that before. Now maybe if we all got head loops on and magnified, we could, but you know, you can see the, the fine trabecular network of the bone, you can see the teeth, the edges of the teeth, the linear striations on the crowns. So um, we get a lot more detail. This is a CAT scan of a rabbit head, and does this have a pointer? Yeah, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work, okay. So these teeth, the upper cheek teeth, are pretty normal, um, but down here you see a relatively small abscess, but we can pick things up early. And because with the CAT scan we get the whole head, we can tell how much is involved and which teeth exactly are involved in this kind of thing. Now, I don't want you to think this side is normal either. What you see here is a fairly close attachment between the bone and the tooth, and this blowing out here is an early infection. So um, we can get a lot of information with CAT scans. IV fluid therapy, veins are difficult to catheterize because they're small. Um, we needed to have small catheters. They would uh, clot or plug up easily. And here again, there's an expense. You know, if you come to my hospital, they itemize everything and you know exactly how much it costs to put a catheter in an animal and I don't know because I don't do that part, charging. <laughs> I go in and talk and then my technician comes in and talks about money, which I like it that way. Um, so as a result, many veterinarians resorted to just giving sub-Q fluids. Well, that they're easy to administer, and th the problem is that they may not be well absorbed. In a normal, healthy rabbit, sub-Q fluids work great. Why would you give them? Well, maybe if their kidneys aren't working so well, you can give them some sub-Q fluids. In a sick rabbit, they don't absorb fluids from the sub-Q space very well, so much better to give it IV. And if you're doing surgery, there's no way to give emergency drugs. So if the heart rate starts getting slower, I can't give atropine because if I give it IV, it works within seconds. If I give it IM, it might take 15 minutes and I probably don't have that long. 
So when we have to give things like epinephrine for cardiac arrest or whatever, we have no way to do that. Now, we, again, veterinarians and technicians are more experienced at placing catheters. We do know that intraosseous is an acceptable route and that we, it's basically equivalent to giving IV. So there have been times when I've been stuck with a situation where I couldn't get a catheter in or whoever I was doing the surgery for couldn't get a catheter. We lost all veins and then I would say, let me put in an intraosseous catheter because I'm really not comfortable anymore doing a procedure without venous access. There's no question about the fluid being absorbed. There's access for emergency drugs. We can continue to provide fluid support, and Dr. Knowles talked about how important keeping them hydrated is. Um, after surgery, as long as we need to, we can give IV antibiotics and other medications. So um, this is a 25-gauge um, IV catheter in a rabbit's uh, cephalic vein, and we can let them peacefully rest there while they get their IV fluids. Um, we can give drugs through the catheter. Uh, this one actually, if any of you are in veterinary medicine, you can tell that this one's 30 years old because they don't make those things anymore. They make, they're that kind now because of HIV. They had to make the lure lock so they didn't come apart and explode and contaminate people. So this is not a rabbit, but this is a baby mouse that has a 25 gauge needle in its tibia. And through that, we can give fluid. And you can see that there is some blood in there. It's not all pink, is it? It's in there. And so even in really small patients, there's no reason not to have access. Analgesia, I loved when Dr. Brown said, um, when we went to vet school, animals didn't feel pain. And I say that to my students and trainees all the time because it is a huge ordeal now. I mean, everything gets preemptive analgesia I means before tissue is injured. It's been, we've learned that analgesics work better if you give them before you cut or smash or whatever you're gonna do. Back then, we didn't use them at all. And we had this philosophy that pain might be a good thing because if you hurt, you don't wanna move around a lot, so you'll recuperate better. Um, some of the drugs might cause problems in rabbits, like the narcotics with motility, uh, or they may be too sedate, and so these are reasons we used to use for not doing them. On the other hand, rabbits are prey species, and when they're in a lot of pain and, and fear and anxiety, they just choose to have catecholamine release and die. And I tell students that you know, if you were a rabbit and an eagle caught you and was carrying you to the nest to be torn to shreds by the babies, would you rather make it to the nest and be torn to shred alive or die on the way? So they just die on the way. <laughs> so now we know um, analgesia is important. It's considered standard of care. Um, it's well accepted that pain is not good in any animal or human. And another good thing that's come along over the years is that many of the ana anesthetic, analgesic, and sedative drugs that we use are reversible. So buprenorphine is a narcotic, and it can be reversed with naloxone or naltrexone. Um, the benzodiazepines, Valium, uh, diazepam, and uh, uh, midazolam are reversed with flumazenil, and metatomidine is reversed by adipamazole. So a lot of the things that we use regularly in rabbits are reversible. If we don't like the effects we're seeing, we can give something to make it go away. Um, also, preemptive analgesia as part of a balanced anesthesia allows us to use small amounts of a lot of different drugs so that we're not getting all the bad effects of any one drug. And this helps with a smooth induction and a smooth recovery. And, and now we realize, as doctor, as they mentioned in the behavior session, pain, stress, and anxiety are not good. <laughs> that looks like a stressful situation. <laughs> Anxiolytics, um, kind of, 
I have to say, even still today, anxiety is not a recognized problem in animals, even in dogs and cats. Um, there was just a paper out in uh, Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association about using trazodone for anxiety in patients um, after surgery, and it was a great benefit. Now, if you go into a hospital for a procedure, like I had an inguinal hernia repaired a few years ago, and the nurse came in and she said, do you want your pre-meds now or do you want to wait a while? And I said, what are you going to give me? And she said, midazolam and fentanyl. Why do you want to wait? Well, I'm not sure exactly when they're going to take you. We might have to repeat them. That's okay. You can repeat them. <laughs> give them now. If they need to be repeated, you can repeat. You have my permission to repeat them. Bursette is midazolam, and they've been using that in humans for anxiety for decades. And fortunately, now it's um, in veterinary world as well. <clears throat> so the, the anxiolytics, benzodiazepines, are very good. Um, commonly used in part of the pre-anesthetic protocol in rabbits. Again, they are reversible. They help reduce the anxiety, which helps with induction and recovery. Also, they reduce the amount of an anesthetic agent needed, whether it's an injectable anesthetic agent or um, an, an inhaled anesthetic agent. So carrying them on post-operatively can be beneficial. Now, if you think they're too sedate, if we think they're too sedate, we can then reverse it, or we can reverse the um, midazolam and leave the metatomidine working. Or, so we have a lot more flexibility with pain and anxiety now than we did 35 years ago. Balanced anesthesia means using a little bit of a lot of things to minimize the negative side effects. So a narcotic analgesic like buprenorphine, anxiolytic like midazolam, and alpha-2 agonist like um, dexmedetomidine, parasympatholytic, some people use, some people don't. Um, slows secretions of the respiratory and oral cavity, um, but it also helps maintain uh, heart rate um, because with sympathetic stimulation, they, parasympathetic stimulation, the heart rate decreases. Then some kind of induction agent, it might be a low dose of ketamine or it might be just a mask with isoflurane and oxygen. So if you look at this list, um, the first three are all reversible and if we're just giving a tiny bit of ketamine, that's not going to be so bad. General anesthesia then, mostly we use injectable agents, uh, ketamine combinations, usually with a barbiturate or xylazine, um, which is reversible with yohimbine, but that they discovered after I graduated from vet school. Acepromazine, there's no reversal for that. Um, so they can't be removed once you inject them. Now you've got a bunch of ketamine and other stuff and um, they can't be reversed other than xylazine in the late 80s. They came out, they discovered yohimbine would reverse it. So um, inhalants were often administered by mask. The two that we had then were halothane and methoxyfluorine and you can't even buy them anymore. Now I don't know if you for a chemical experiment, you could get them, but they're not commercially available. Um, isoflurane and the newer inhalant anesthetics are only available. And that's because they had more serious cardiopulmonary consequences where isoflurane and fluorane, desflurane, those guys don't have so much. Um, and then most didn't have an endotracheal pl tube placed. I think um, they're small sizes because even now, if you go try to buy endotracheal tubes, unless you go to a special place, you can't get them two millimeters, 2.5 millimeters, one, one and a half millimeter. Those of us who use those know where to find them, but if you just go to the average place, they're not, still not readily available, but they're available if you need them. Um, I, don't know. I used to get them at my tech career. <laughs> the um, Veterinary Specialty Products, ESP. I think they have a website. They sell them. That's where I used to get them. Um, and, and yet, endotracheal intubation is vital for respiratory support. So we recognize that. 
And I can tell you that as a, a resident in surgery in Colorado in the early 80s, um, working with rabbits, um, what would usually happen when I had to do surgery on a rabbit, I would go to the anesthesia department and they would get all ready and they would try to intubate the rabbit and they would try and try and try and try and try and try because their training was you have to have an airway which is appropriate training and then eventually they'd give up. Sometimes it'd be an hour they're trying to intubate the rabbit. Well, we all now know that's bad. <laughs> And then I would go to surgery and would die. And so it was very frustrating for me and I would blame anesthesia, but they just didn't know how to do it. So this, this, is, this could be considered a chamber induction, but it's a, a face mask. And then once they're, once they're sleepy, we would just secure this around like a piece of tape around the back of the head to hold it in place. So we would deliver oxygen and we would deliver anesthetic gases, but if you stop breathing, you're dead in the water. There's really nothing that you could do. So now um, inhalant anesthetic is considered standard of care. Um, endotracheal tubes are now available as small as one millimeter in diameter, and that is really small. Um, it's the best to intubate rabbits alternative is V-gel or nasal oxygen. And um, there, there are two ways that I use to intubate rabbits. One is the blind method. And I learned that first because we didn't have little scopes when, back in the 80s. And the other is to use a scope. And I'll quickly go through that. Um, so other than for brief minor procedures, uh, endotracheal intubation is strongly recommended. It allows for oxygen to be carried directly to the lungs. If the patient stops breathing, we can breathe for them. Um, and it allows for accurate administration of anesthetic gases. And just, uh, you know, the ABCs of CPR, we all learned at some point, A stands for airway, so it's considered the number one most important thing in an arrest situation is having an airway. B stands for breathing, and if you don't have an airway, you can't breathe, which is why A is airway and it comes before breathing. If you have an endotracheal tube in place, you can then breathe for them if they stop breathing and their heart's still going. So blind intubation, I like to use a little bit of lidocaine and let that deaden the glottis. Um, it's important to make a straight shot down into the trachea so that um, the tube goes into the trachea instead of the esophagus. Um, and then I'll kind of demonstrate this. So this was a Sunday morning I got called in. This rabbit had um, stones in both ureters, so it wasn't able to get urine out of the kidneys a Sunday morning, and that's why I'm in those clothes. And I just had a shower and my hair looks nice. Um, <laughs> So what I do is listen for the glottis, and I should hear nice, smooth sounds like If it's garbled, it's not in the right spot. Once I hear that, I, ha I put about 0 0.1 to 0.2 cc's of lidocaine in the tube, and then I blow it so it sprays onto the glottis. And then we put the mask back on, and, and this animal is sedate with pre-anesthetic. It's not completely induced yet. So we wait a little bit longer, and then, don't I look peaceful? <laughs> Listen again, and I want to hear the in out. And the glottis has two doors called um, arytenoids, and they open when we inhale, and they relax when we exhale. So you want to slip the tube in when on inhalation, because that's when they're opening. So you have to get, that's what I'm doing. I'm getting in the zen of breathing. In, out, in, out. And when they breathe in, you just slide the tube in. And it sounds really easy. <laughs> and it, there's a learning curve for sure. And it, it just takes practice. What I tell people when they're starting is, and every time you do a procedure on a rabbit, try to intubate it. And I have a three-try rule. If I can't get it in three times, I quit. 
that came from my residency days when the anesthesiologists would try for an hour, and I think they just bang the glottis up, it swells, and then all of a sudden they can't move air and they die. So you have to be gentle and just try a couple times, and if it doesn't work, give up, take your x-rays with a mask instead, but eventually you'll learn to be able to intubate them. The next way that I have done it, um, and for me, um, the big rabbits, I don't have any trouble intubating. Uh, it's when they get really small, like Joey Truffles was um, 950 grams when I met him, and I could not get a two millimeter tube in him. The 1.0 and 1.5 millimeter endotracheal tubes are really flimsy. They don't have much substance to them. Um, and so you can't use the blind technique because the tube bends too easily. So the alternative, and that's not a rabbit, it's a chinchilla, but um, is to use a rigid scope. And again, these weren't available back in the 80s or 90s. And I do find with um, this technique, it helps to pull the tongue out. With the blind technique, I don't worry about where the tongue is. This is just a, a bat, literally a battery handle and battery, uh, I mean a flashlight handle with batteries, C size of batteries, and it connects to this thing. And that's a one millimeter scope. So that's really, really tiny. The next thing then is you take an endotracheal tube, and that's a two millimeter endotracheal tube, and you stick the scope through it. Now clearly the scope has to be short enough that the end of the scope comes out. And then um, we go, here I'm fishing the tongue out, because I find that for me to see, because I'm actually going to look at the glottis and see the trachea, and pass the scope into the trachea and then slide the tube off the scope into the trachea. With the tongue in there, it's sort of, there's a wad of tissue back there, so I find pulling the tongue out is, is helpful for this. So now I can actually see where I need to put the tube. I literally advance the metal scope slightly down into the trachea and then slide the tube off. And that's the other way that I intubate. This is Matt Johnson, who's a uh, exotics faculty at Colorado State. This is another way to do it. Um, this is an otoscope, so it's made for looking in ears. And he's looking at the glottis like I did, but he's passing the tube alongside the scope. Now, I tried that and it doesn't work for me. And maybe I wasn't patient enough and I had other um, abilities at my disposal, my blind intubation and my other scope, but he still does it this way. When I was at LSU a few weeks ago, they intubated uh, Sir Hop a lot that way. <laughs> Are any of you familiar with this V-gel thing? Yeah. yeah. Have you used it? My vet does. So. Uh, your vet does? My vet does. So, I've used it. Yeah? It's a, a little. Think of the easier than it is if you just go out and come and say that. Okay. So the idea is that this thing um, has a blunt end that goes into the esophagus because the big issue when you're intubating is it's way easier to go into the esophagus than it is into the trachea unless you're trying to put a tube into the esophagus and then it goes into the trachea. Um, so, and then it abuts the, the glottis so it covers over the glottis. There's no tube that goes down into the trachea. It just covers over, there's a little gel that makes a seal and it connects to an anesthesia machine. So this company actually, I, I heard about it and I asked him to send me some and it took some negotiating and I have to admit I had never used them still. Um, so I'm gonna take them to the AEM, but AEMB conference and maybe we'll use them there. But um, they're not cheap, they're a few hundred dollars each, but they say you can use them 50 times and they even have a little, thing with 50 numbers on you, cross off each time you use it so you know when it's time to throw it away, I guess. Um, but the bottom line is if you can't intubate, it still gives you good access and control to the airway. This is what it looks like. So um, this is the part that connects to the anesthesia machine. This is the part that goes over the glottis and this is the part that plugs up the esophagus. Um, and this is what it looks like in sight. This is the airway here, the glottis here, so this is the breathing hole that connects here, and this is blunt 
blind ended and blocks the esophagus. So it seems like a good idea. I think um, it, if you can learn how to position them properly, uh, it would give you the ability to ventilate. So if they stop breathing, the seal is tight enough that you can expand the lungs, whereas nasal oxygen is putting oxygen in the nose and trying to keep the head straight so that it doesn't kink the trachea. Um, if they stop breathing, you still have no way to ventilate them. So this allows for them to be ventilated, and, and this is a rabbit with one in place. The other thing I didn't realize when I asked for a free sample was they come in a variety of sizes. <laughs> so um, you, different sizes for different size rabbits. That's the website if you're interested in investigating docsinnovent.com. Aseptic technique means the sterility of the surgeon in the OR. Um, this is what we used to do, and I, I would say that you know, at least this surgeon has a mask and a cap on. Uh, a lot of people would just wear gloves. And would you want your surgeon to just wear gloves? Probably not. Um, you can see that there is no sterile field. His arm is on the table, and his nose hairs are in the surgery site. <laughs> but, you know, there really were all board certified surgeons were at universities, they weren't out in the world. Nowadays, there are in most major cities, there are boarded surgeons. And general practitioners were not trained in surgery, and, and they had to do the best they could. So now we do things in a dedicated operating room under aseptic condition. These rooms have laminar airflow so that it minimizes the amount of bacteria in the room. They're cleaned extra special, and the surgeon wears a cap, mask, gown, glove, booties, and um, proper pre preparation, aseptic preparation of the patient and uh, the surgeon as well. So the difference here, she's got um, this is actually an operating microscope, and she's in a sterile gown with sterile gloves and mask and cap, and all of this is covered with sterile drape to try to minimize the risk of infection. So just a, a little about the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. That's what I'm a member of, and I'll point out that the word diplomate has an E in it. It's not diplomat. They're um, government. Um, Official diplomate means that the person holds a diploma from this organization. So a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons, to be that you have to have at least four years of training in surgery under certain conditions and it's pretty strict and then you have to pass a three-day examination. And that's kind of what made me unique is that I did that and then I worked with exotic animals. Um, and so what it did for me was give me knowledge about anatomy, surgical diseases, aseptic technique, what we can do, what we can't do, and stuff like that. Now, <clears throat> there are, uh, when I became boarded, there were 350 board certified surgeons in the world. There are now close to 1,000, so there's still not a lot, but there are a lot of boarded surgeons in private practice and they're usually comfortable doing the surgery. So if you have a rabbit with a ureteral stone, the stone in the ureter that goes from the kidney to the bladder, they know how to take it out and they know how to close the ureter. What they don't know is the anesthesia and the post-op care. So if your rabbit veterinarian is willing to do the anesthesia for them and take the rabbit to their hospital after surgery and do the recu recuperation, a lot of um, veterinary surgeons are willing to perform the procedures. So keep that in mind, and I will say that I'm always willing to talk to surgeons. There's a lot of stuff they don't know that I've learned over the 35 years, and I can make it easier for them, uh, little tricks and things. So I'm easy to find, and I'm always happy to consult. Um, microsurgical techniques has also helped a lot with the small patients that are delicate. Um, this is a microsurgical thumb forcep. You can see the tip is very fine, as has magnification. I just about don't do anything in a rabbit without magnification. This is an old picture. The, the lenses are now much smaller and 
and much more lightweight. But um, very, to me, that it's very, very important. And when I'm training other people in these things and they say, oh, I, I'm not old. <laughs> I don't need those things. And I go, oh, so you're Superman. You can see 5X. <laughs> It's not about your visual acuity, it's about magnifying things so you can see them better. You can see small blood vessels better. Um, it makes the whole process uh, go a lot better. This is me when I was young, and the way you can tell is that I don't have the do-lap. <laughs> there I do. I wish I knew how to do, there must be some surgery for that. Um, but these are hobby loops, and you can buy them for like $50 at the hobby store, um, and they're okay, but they're definitely not the quality that uh, most surgeons are using nowadays, and I'm, I'm doing a dental procedure on that rabbit. Monitoring, um, often there wasn't any monitoring done back then. Maybe a technician was uh, listening to the heart with a stethoscope or watching for breathing. Now we've got a ton of things we use, EKG, temperature probes, pul pulse oximeter, which tells the amount of oxygen in the hemoglobin in the blood, and tidal CO2, tells how much CO2 the body is producing. Bre breathing monitors, a lot of places we have ventilators that we've put almost every animal on a ventilator, and blood pressure, like I still, blood pressure baffles me because um, I didn't learn it in school. I mean, I know about it now, but when, when I was in school, animals didn't have blood pressure. <laughs> um, so the yellow thing is a pulse oximeter. We want it to be around 100%, high 90s for sure. If it starts to drop, there's a problem. This is a breath monitor. All it does is say it beeps every time the animal breathes. Um, and that's a Doppler. Doppler um, signals to flow. So you can put it on the heart or near the heart and it'll tell you the heart's actually pumping fluid because it monitors fluid flow. It is part of how we measure blood pressure nowadays. Um, and you can also put it on any artery and it will tell you that the arteries are pumping. So as long as you hear the <laughs> or in the rabbit's case, <laughs> we know they're okay. Um, this is a pulse ox or I'm sorry, a Doppler on the ear, on the artery. Remember the middle one's the artery. We can also do direct blood pressure monitoring. So the sigmomanometer that they do at the doctor's office is kind of what we do more often in animals. Now, um, back when I was younger, we did more direct arterial blood pressure monitor. So we put a catheter in an artery and we know exactly it's not kind of close sort of subject to interpretation of when you start hearing the psh, psh, psh. Um, And so that can be done as well, um, connected to a manometer that tells you what the blood pressure is. So this is not a rabbit, it's a prairie dog that we were doing a spinal surgery. He had a slip disc that caused him to chew his back leg. But just to show, he's got a pulse oximeter, a rectal temperature probe, an IV catheter, he's intubated and on an ECG. So my philosophy is the more things I have, because what happens is they all fail at some point along the case of the surgery. So hopefully by the end, something is still working and you know your patient's still alive. I don't know if you guys know this, this yoke thing. A lot of rabbits don't like e-collars, Elizabethan collars. And um, this is that prairie dog because he wanted to chew his back foot. So you just make a donut with bandaging material, slip it around the head, and then pinch it here, and they don't have the big cone effect thing. Recovery, um, they're often left to recover unattended. We kind of had the philosophy, put them in a box in a dark, quiet corner, and hopefully they wake up okay. Um, we were of the philosophy, we need to get them out of here as soon as possible, and maybe that was because that way, if they don't do well, it wasn't my fault, it was your fault. Um, <laughs> We're reluctant to give analgesics because narcotic analgesics can slow the GI tract. We now know it's insignificant most of the time, and we have motility stimulants that we didn't have back then. Yes, we didn't have metoclopramide when I went to school. <laughs> um, no non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs were available for animals. Um, we used aspirin in dogs, 
and we didn't have many safe antibiotics. Now we have Batril. There aren't a whole lot of new antibiotics that are safe in rabbits, and we still use some of the old ones like trimethoprim sulfa and chl chloramphenicol as well. Um, but now we feel more like we need to make sure that they're doing well when they go home. So we keep them on IV fluids after surgery until they're eating and drinking on their own. We do continue analgesics. We regularly prescribe anti-inflammatory drugs and try to keep them calm and comfortable. And then we monitor the appetite, um, offer a variety of food. We do have GI motility stimulants now. And we also, thanks to Oxbo starting and others joining in, have syringe feeding diets because I remember blenderizing rabbit pellets, trying to get them to go through tubes um, and syringes, and it's not always easy. Um, but now we generally don't want them to go home until we feel like they're stable eating and drinking and pooping. So I'm gonna, um, t I, I'm, time flies, um, talk a little bit about some of the specific conditions. Like I said earlier, when I went to school in my residency, the only surgical disease of rabbits I knew was hairballs. And it was thought to be a common cause of death. We were told take them to surgery as soon as possible. Most didn't do very well. Um, now we understand that what we thought was hairball, and I won't even, that's not even from a rabbit, that's from a, guinea pig, and it was actually a hairball, um, is uh, GI stasis. And so um, the principles of managing GI stasis, and I won't go into that, um, just quickly, it's pretty straightforward to put a nasal esophageal feeding tube in. Um, just use a topical anesthetic in the nostril, and then run the tube in and check that it's in the stomach and then um, suture it in place. And a couple of things that are important is you want this to come out in the corner here and a suture there so they don't take their toenail and tear it out and then put it so that they don't see it. So it comes up the middle so it's not in their sight. Um, bloat, on the other hand, is something that we do deal with. Um, and it's usually due to a piece of that matted fur and fiber breaking off and going into the small intestine and getting stuck. The most common location is the duodenum, just, just past the stomach. So it gets out of the stomach, but it doesn't get very far. Now, because rabbits can't vomit and their stomach produces fluid and gas, it can't go out the duodenum and it can't go out the esophagus. They blow it up really big. I don't know if you've heard about um, GDV or bloat in dogs, and I think this condition is very similar. It's a very serious, life-threatening condition, and the most important part for survival is decompressing the stomach. Whether you use a nasogastric tube or a trocar, a needle stick, or even in some cases, I think what happens with those small tubes and a needle is the fibers plug the lumen and so you get a little gas and then it stops and you don't want to keep poking needles in the stomach um, so an alternative is to use a local anesthetic and actually suture the stomach to the body wall and make an incision so that you have direct access to the stomach and you can take um, big pieces out or air or whatever with GDV, we don't take them to surgery until they're stable, and the same is true with rabbits. So it's really vital to decompress the stomach. Um, this is a case from Dr. Karen Rosenthal. You can see the stomach is huge and full of gas. Um, gas is this color, so there's also a lot of fluid in there, and that's pretty typical. Gas and liquid um, come out through tubes pretty easily. If there's a lot of fiber or hair in the stomach, it, it'll be harder to decompress them. So they put in a, this, you can see this tube is bigger because we want to get as much stuff out of the stomach as possible. And this is an intraoperative view and that's where the, the piece of felt stuck and caused the bloat problem. Spay, um, back then, rarely done. Um, it was usually done as a treatment for 
uterine disease like cancer or dystocia, difficult birth or uterine infection. Um, again, we were uh, always concerned about anesthesia. Um, this is a rabbit reproductive tract. They do have two horns and each horn has its own cervix and the ovaries are over there that are kind of coiled in the, the back part of the abdomen. Now we routinely recommend spaying rabbits to prevent uterine adenocarcinoma. We recommend that it be done at an early age. Um, and ovariectomy in, involves removing just the ovaries and it has been shown to prevent uterine cancer, just removing the ovaries. Ovariohysterectomy means removing the ovaries and the uterus both. It takes longer and there are some more risks associated with it. It took me a while to find this article from 1975 and one thing you need to know is that castration is done in both males and females. So the word castration just means remove the gonad. So when I first looked at this, I'm like, what? Castration? Because I tend to think of it as a male thing. But they removed the ovaries in rabbits and then they, some rabbits, they didn't do anything. Some they gave estrogen and some they gave progestins to and looked at the incidence of development of uterine cancer. And if they were just ovariectomized, which all these rabbits just had the ovaries removed, the incidence of cancer was next to none. So way back in 1975, we knew that, yeah. At what age? Um, I can't remember. Because they, if they're measuring, say, cancer up to age five. Yeah, they were young rabbits. Yeah, because our rabbits are raised in the Right. Yeah, if you put, I have the article on my computer, I just don't remember the age, but they were young rabbits. Um, because again, they're trying to prevent it, so if you waited until they were five years old, they probably already have it, a lot of them. So I can't remember the exact age, yeah. I don't think she meant their age at the age of the spay, but how, how long did they carry them out? Uh, yeah, I can't remember that either. It's, Yeah, um, so the, in, in every other species as well, if you just remove the ovary, the uterus atrophies away because all of the uterine activity is due to estrogen and progesterone. So without those two hormones, the uterus just shrivels up. Um, and that's been well studied in a lot of species. So I don't know if maybe um, they leave a part of the ovary and then that would happen for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so th th she's saying there's a feedback loop between the ovaries and the uterus, and in humans, if they take the uterus out and leave the ovaries, they decrease the incidence of ovarian cancer. If I could add, um, in Europe, they do this more commonly. They say six months and less to spay the rabbit. At that age, you do not see incidences of uh, uterine cancer later in life. And how much later in life? I don't know. I don't have any data of studies, but that's the general. Yeah. And, yeah, and I was just going to say that uh, with the advent of minimally invasive surgery, um, in, even in dogs and cats now, we more are more likely to do um, ovariectomy. And that kind of, that actually the veterinary surgery journal that's published by the American College of Veterinary Surgeons um, commissioned a paper c from some European surgeons because in Europe, they've been doing ovariectomies for years. And they reviewed the literature and compared the two and their conclusion was that there was no reason to take the uterus and in fact there might be reasons not to. Um, this is a rabbit that had uterine cancer. It had spread to the mammary gland and also to the lung. Um, there's mass there, there, there. So we want to get them young. Um, it's not a very common problem in rabbits. 
So minimally invasive, um, and I, I'm, because of time, I'll just show you. This is a, a rabbit we're taking a liver biopsy and a kidney biopsy. And this is a cut biopsy forceps, so we're able to take a piece out through a five millimeter hole, put a hemostatic agent in there to let, help clot the blood on the liver. And then the next phase is this is a kidney biopsy and we're going to use a needle biopsy for that. There's the needle directed into the kidney and fire to collect the sample. And then again, another hemostatic agent carrying it in there to help stop the bleeding. So these are the kind of, you know, cool things that we can do now. Um, another, this is actually a, probably uh, uh, removing a kidney from a rabbit laparoscopically. And it, it's kind of a, um, a, a few minutes of a video, but it's kind of cool, isn't it? Um, <laughs> this is a threaded cannula, so it allows us to go in. This is a fan retractor to pull away. This is that same kidney we biopsied. This is, there's the, the biopsy site um, after we found out what was wrong with it. And then um, dissecting tissues away to because kidneys are buried in fat. And we have a lot of cool devices available these days, and you'll see a number of them in this video. Um, I don't know if there's a fast mode, but it's fun to watch anyway. <laughs> well, it is for me. <laughs> so this device is called a ligature. It's FDA approved to seal blood vessels up to seven millimeters in diameter. Seven millimeters is pretty big. Um, it's a bipolar cautery, so it cooks the tissue in the middle, and then there, there's a blade that shoots out and cuts the tissue when you pull the trigger. Um, so they will also show you another cool thing we have for minimally invasive surgery. Um, now they're going to isolate the blood vessels. So there's an artery in the vein that go to the kidney. Um, artery goes, the vein leaves. Um, I don't remember, I'm sorry. It was that one that had the hydronephrosis. I think it was infected. <coughs> so this is um, just more dissection, I guess. Sort of tearing through the fat first to isolate the kidney. Now he's going to use this bipolar to stop that little bleeding. This was one of my residents that did this. So you were watching it as he was doing it. Yeah. And then um, isolate the blood vessels with the right angle forceps, and then they're going to use a hemoclips, which you may know of hemoclips, but they make them so they go through a, a port, and they'll clip the. Now they're going to come in with the hemoclips and put clips on it. How big is the hole to the, the holes, the, the camera um, scope, the scope, I use a 2.7 millimeter scope, and that allows the visualization, but the instrumentation. This hemoclip applier has to go through a 10 millimeter port. The other is through a five millimeter port. So um, either five or 10 millimeter, and the scope I use a 2.7. I use a five in dogs and a 2.7 in small animals. Well, that's the thing is you always have to think that we make these um, small <coughs> ports for minimally invasive surgery, but the bottom line, and I always tell owners this, whether it's a tumor or a kidney is, we have to get it out. Now in people, they macerate it, they have machines that grind it up, in a, they put it in a plastic bag inside your abdomen and grind it up and pull the bag out. Um, we can't afford to do that still, it hasn't become affordable. So what we do is um, 
we do, I do use the bags and put them in the bags, or in this case, you can just pull it by the ureter, pull it up to the body wall, and enlarge one of the incisions long enough to get it out. Now, then you, and I, I won't tell you that this is faster than open surgery. The advantages are that the incisions are smaller, and even still, because to take the kidney out of a rabbit, you have to go from the diploid to the pubis. It's a big incision. So even if it's only three centimeters, that's better than what it would have been. Um, also, we aren't pulling on body wall and doing puddling around with things in the belly, like the intestinal tract. So I think that the recovery is better. But um, how big is the kidney? It's about that big, oh. three centimeters, two to three. So this is the ureter. They pulled it out. The, we're supposed to take it as close to the bladder as possible so that no urine goes backwards. But I don't think urine goes backwards very often anyway. So with this? No, if we were doing it, I'm sorry, laparoscopically? No, if you're doing it open. Um, now you have to ask the question again because okay. my brain was thinking laparoscopic. No, if you're doing a full area of the breast, right. like going back, uh, open. Because we do that laparoscopically too. Oh, you do? Yes. <laughs> but if, if you're here in a regular practice, right. like lying up and you're okay. doing a full, like what I would say, where exactly would you ligate this through the uterus? I, I like to actually ligate through the vaginal vault, okay. just caudal to the cervices. And the reason for that I learned from Dr. Brown is that some rabbits get uterine aneurysm, and if you leave the cervix, they can get an aneurysm, it can rupture, and they can bleed out through the vagina. So you remove the cervix and you go to the vaginal. Yep. And, and the vaginal vault is really thin-walled there, so it's, pretty, it's big, but it's easy to ligate off. Okay, <laughs> um, otitis. Back then, there were no reports of surgical management of ear disease. And there are three places, we, uh, media, what, let me start. Interna is in the brain. Um, externa is the external ear canal, like this thing we stick our Q-tips in. Otitis media is the, is the bulla or the middle ear, and that's that bump right here on you. Um, and so it was known that rabbits get otitis media without externa, often caused by pastorella. Um, and if it turns into otitis interna, so some rabbits can have external ear canal disease that breaks the eardrum and then the middle ear gets infected and then it goes into the inner ear, so they have all three. And that's the head tilt um, <coughs> is not always a sign of E. cuniculi. It can also be a problem with um, <coughs> ear. Um, I appreciate Dr. Knoll's statement about $1,400 for artwork and getting an estimate first. I commissioned this drawing um, when I was at the University of Illinois, and I didn't get an estimate first either, and I remember it cost a way lot more than I thought it was going to. Um, <coughs> rabbit ear anatomy is di different, and it's not something you can pick up a book and find a lot about. So I went to several anatomy books, even an old German thing that I had to find someone translate for me to figure out how, and then dissection, how rabbit's ear goes. Our ear has a horizontal canal, right? You stick in, you pop your eardrum, right? Dogs have a horizontal canal, and a vertical canal, so it makes an elbow bend. <clears throat> if you stick Q-tips down a dog's ear, you'll never break their eardrum because you have to stick it down, turn it 90 degrees, and then shove it in to get to the eardrum. So when we do an ear exam, we have to start this way and then turn this way and go in. Rabbits have a vertical ear canal. They don't have a horizontal ear canal at all. They're, this is the bulla. This is the mandible. So it's right at the back of the mandible. It's bone, and it has, unlike dogs and cats, this bony acoustic meatus here. The eardrum is deep to that, so the eardrum itself is within bone. Around that is this cartilaginous incisure acoustic meatus. It wraps around the bony acoustic meatus. And then beyond that are these strangely shaped pieces of cartilage that form a tube. Um, so it's helpful to understand
understand that. And until I investigated, I didn't realize how little we knew about rabbit ears. Um, this was in a publication we did in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. Eric Chow was my intern, and he's the first author on um, total ear canal ablation and velociotomy in rabbits. He also wrote an article in the Journal of Exotic Pet Medicine on ear disease, or surgical management of ear diseases in rabbits. Uh, so if you want to find this, um, this shows what we do with a velociotomy. But with the total ear canal ablation, we're removing all of this and the outer part of this, the middle ear. And I'll try to explain more why. So this is an example. This is a CAT scan, and these are what's called coronal views. So it's like from the top of the head down. And this is the bad bulla, and this is the good bulla. And that bulla is full of pus. So it's meant to be an air-filled space. What kind of blood supply does air filled space have? None. Now it's full of pus. What kind of blood supply does pus have? None. So my contention is that all the antibiotics in the world are not gonna get rid of that. I consider this a surgical disease. We go in and clean all that stuff out. So this is Eric Chow's article um, in the Journal of Exotic Pet Medicine, um, 2011, volume 20, page 182 to 87. And that's not in your notes, so you can write it down if you want to go look it up or take a picture. Okay. Um, so the two procedures that I do most commonly are ventral bull osteotomy, and that's for treatment of middle ear disease when the external ear is clean. So these rabbits, you look in their ear and it's completely normal. Um, they have a head tilt or there's a swelling there or drainage from this general vicinity. Um, <clears throat> we go in and collect samples, clean it out. Now that air-filled pocket is open because we've removed bone. Blood vessels grow in, fibrous tissue grows in, and it fills the bulla with tissue that has a blood supply. So that's a good thing. Um, plus, we did our, uh, we helped them along by getting the pus out, and hopefully we got a positive culture and we know what kind of antibiotic is best to use. <clears throat> now, it will decrease hearing, but a lot of people say they couldn't hear anyway. If a rabbit has one good ear, they can still hear and interact you, with you. If both are bad, um, they will have decreased hearing. But again, if your bulla is full of pus, you probably don't hear very well anyway. Um, so this is a, from Popesco's anatomy book on rabbits and shows the shape of the bulla. Uh, this is where we're gonna be working and this bone is very hard out here, but down here it's very thin, almost eggshell. So when I do this, I like to start here and if we're doing a ventral bulla, go in right here along the mandible and just go down. You can kind of imagine on yourself, it's right there. If you went in through there, eventually you would get to that bump behind your ear, right? And so here's an example of that. And um, this is the bulla. We've cleaned all the tissue off and used a pin to make a hole in it. And the mandible is over here, the tongue is over here, and this retractor is just there's really not a lot in between there. There's some muscles and some loose tissue, but it's pretty easy to get there. Now, once I have a small hole started with an IM pin, then I use rungers that bite bone to enlarge that hole. And then we take a curette, it's like a little ice cream scoop, and scoop out all the pus, culture it, flush it out, and then close it up. So it's, it's better than if you don't have external ear disease, it's better than the ear ablation and bulla osteotomy. You're less likely to get facial nerve damage. Um, it's better access because you're going from below instead of from the side. You can see the hole inside. Um, and you could do both at once without turning them over. Whereas 
Sir, Hop Sir Hopalot at LSU had to be flipped over and then the surgeons are standing there for 10 minutes while they turn him over and prep the other side. Oops. Um, total ear canal ablation and lateral osteotomy is needed when there's otitis externa, so the external ear canal has an infection and it also has otitis media. And the reason is that it gets rid of all the diseased skin. Um, there's still some potential for recurrence, but um, it's a lot lower. This is a rabbit that had an otitis externa and media. Um, one thing here, the facial nerve, which allows us to blink and move our face. You've seen people with facial palsy in the room kind of like this. That's what this rabbit has. Now, um, it's actually this side that's affected, and what happens, you can see his lip is kind of pulled over this way. Over time, the muscle atrophy, and then it fibrosis, and it contracts, and it'll pull it over there. The, the real good test is this. Um, facial nerve allows us to blink, and he can blink on this side, and he cannot blink on this side. Um, and this is an intraoperative view. Uh, what we've done here is the pinna, or the floppy ear, is all of this, and we've cut the cartilage circumferentially around, so now we have the tube that goes down to the bony part and we're just dissecting, staying very close to the cartilage because the facial nerve is in the neighborhood. And go all the way down to the bone and then cut it off and um, send it in for analysis. Now the other thing I like to do to try to minimize the risk of recurrence is place antibiotic impregnated um, beads. And that's what I'm doing here. Now uh, the thing with the beads is they you can't put them in a pool of pus, they won't work. They're mainly for cleaning up microscopic levels of infection that we can't see. So when we close, this is what it looks like. There's no tube anymore. The tube's gone. So all that nasty tissue in the tube is in formalin, and there's no hole there, and it's all sutured closed. So. Now in dogs, they've done studies where they put electrodes on the head and they've found that um, they can still hear. And I've had a lot of owners tell me that they think they hear better, which I doubt. I think that they're in so much pain that after surgery, they interact with the owner better <laughs> because they're not afraid to have their head touched. Um, I, I'll finish up with thymomas. Um, Back then, there were no reports of successful removal of thymomas and mainly diagnosed at post-mortem. Um, now it's a pretty well-recognized situation. Uh, clinical signs, intermittent bulgy eyes, and that's because the thymoma compresses the cranial vena cava, the jugular veins drain to that. So in certain positions, it doesn't, the blood doesn't drain and they have the orbital sinus, so it backs up and the eyes bulge out. Um, up here is a normal chest x-ray on a rabbit, and this is one that has a thymoma. The heart is in there somewhere. Um, so this is an example of where I was able to take my knowledge of surgery and apply it to rabbits, and we, this is my resident. We published this in 1998, um, the first successful removal of thymoma in a rabbit through the, the sternum. And then a couple years ago, Kathy Andres was a resident where I was working and her mentor, Cecile Sidlecki, said, I can't write papers and she needs to do a paper. Do you have an idea? And I said, yeah, rabbit thymomas. Our idea, my idea was to compare surgery, radiation, and chemo, but we couldn't get enough cases to make a valid comparison. But um, she was able to pull 19 cases that were treated with radiation. Um, it's, a, it's a viable option, it's still not a cure. Surgery is the best chance at curing. Um, so this rabbit has a thymoma. It's this whitish mass here and all of that there. And this is the one um, actually that we published on. Here we are preparing for surgery. You can see we have lots of instrumentation going on there making an incision now. And people, when they crack your chest, they literally split the sternum and 
dogs and cats have sternebrae, so there's a series of them that we split in half. So I was trying to split them in half in a rabbit. They're too small. So I disarticulate the rib and then spread it apart like this. Now, there's the thymoma there. It looks like heart, but it's wrapped around the great vessels, the subclavian, the carotids, all those guys. And they generally peel out pretty well. Um, so now you can see there is lung here and the heart's back there and the tumor is gone. And um, we then close, we have a tube so in the chest so we can pull any fluid, liquid uh, blood or air that might accumulate. And he went on to die of a cancer of his leg. So he did, um, he recovered and did very well for a period of time. I'm out of time, so I'll try to answer some, do I have time for some questions or not? Well, five minutes? Okay. So the back, um, what we used to do is treat these like abscesses in dogs and cats, which is lance drain, flush out, and, and put a drain in. It doesn't work. They usually recur. Um, the wall of the abscess, if you cut into one, has little tiny pearl-like structures that are like mini abscesses. So here, you can tell this is from when I was a resident, because there's a mask, it's not intubated, and that rabbit um, filleted open trying to, that's this rabbit. Um, it has a bulgy eye from an abscess behind the eye. You wonder how people don't notice their teeth are like that. And then another method was to pack uh, betadine soaked gauze into there. And I just got, it was a very, very frustrating problem. So now, of course, we know um, d dental disease and uh, the, the role of diet. Um, and I think imaging is extremely important. And I put in here in red, would you go to a dentist that looked in your mouth while you were chewing gum? and said, oh, you're fine, see you back in six months. <laughs> but that's what a lot of us do. Um, they stick an otoscope in, and, th and uh, the rabbit's awake and chewing on the cone, and they're trying to look. And, or here's the vaginal speculum, and even more restraint, and looking with a flashlight. And then, Another, this is a vaginal speculum that has a light source attached to it. So I think it's vital to get a good exam, an oral exam, and this, this is a chinchilla, but it's, it's under anesthesia, and um, we can get a good look in the mouth that way. Um, David Crosley invented these things, these um, instruments to open the mouth. One thing about re early detection of rabbit dental disease is the mandible. And if you feel that your mandible is a smooth line, right, so should your rabbit. If you feel bumps, that is not normal. Not, they should not have any bumps at all on their mandible. And if they do, that means that they're retro, there's retrograde growth. So since someone else is going to um, talk about dentistry more, I'll just... Um, go to my, so radiographs I think are really important and these are normal and I, I put these in just because I teach a lot of vets about what's normal. Um, the, they should have a jagged surface. Um, the mandible cortex should be smooth. There's no bumps there. When there's bumps it's because these roots are drawing the wrong direction or the germinal tissue. Um, long incisors and this should not be trying to grow through the, the maxilla. Um, I like four views, so that view shows me the teeth in general. Here we can see some of the rostral cheek teeth on especially the maxillary arcade. Um, the ones that are the most helpful are the obliques. So here, this is one mandible, one side, and the opposite maxilla is up here, where we can isolate them, and then the other two are superimposed on each other. 
So if I know this is the right mandible and there's a bubble there, then I know where that tooth is. And similarly, we look up here. If there's an ocular discharge on the left, maybe we would do some abnormalities there. Um, if money and time are an issue, I, if I can just have two oblique views like this, I can tell a lot. Now this is the other side. Um, there should be a thin halo around each one and they should have these linear striations. Um, also, you can see the bullets on these. Um, and that's another thing you can look at with the skull as on, on rabbit. CT, of course, is really helpful. This rabbit has a retrovolvar abscess that's push pushing his eye out. Um, this reference, um, David Crosley and Estella Vomer put together, and it, it's a German publication, but you can get it in English. And it's how to use anatomic reference lines that will tell you very early changes in the dental condition so that um, you can start doing something about it early. So my principles for managing abscesses, and that's mainly what I wanted to finish up with, is remove all of the infected tissue, including the capsules. So I treat them like a tumor. I don't cut into them. I try not to even break them. Remove any and all teeth that are involved. And that's another reason we used to fail, is I didn't realize there were dead teeth in there. Um, topical antibiotics, with either antibiotic impregnated beads or um, antibiotic soap gauze, Mike Taylor at Guelph did that. But if you use bees, you can do a primary closure. <coughs> so this is an example, a rabbit with a big jaw abscess. I dissect it out, so I'm going all around it. I'm taking the whole capsule with the abscess, not cutting into it. Track it down to the mandible, and once you get down to bone, you have to cut. So I cut off really quick and then wash it out really carefully and cure it any infected bone away, take any teeth out that might be involved, and then place these beads and um, suture tissue over and close it up. Now the advantage of the beads is that they release antibiotics slowly for a long period of time. Um, some of them as long as five years. So you don't have to keep giving antibiotics for months and months and months. I usually do for a couple weeks and then I let the beads do their job. Okay, I'm way past my time. Oh, wait, I have to tell you this. <laughs> so this rabbit, you can see, has beads and no teeth. No cheek teeth. So people think rabbits have to have teeth. They don't, especially with the diets that are available. <laughs> he had all his teeth removed. And there's no evidence of infection, nice clean bone, no moth-eaten, rotten. Okay, I'll quit now. Thanks very much.